Non-Monogamy Help is a podcast where your questions about open, non-monogamous or polyamorous relationships are answered. Our host, Lola Phoenix, will consult a licensed therapist with over a decade of experience to address your problems. Names and locations have been changed or censored to keep your questions anonymous. You're listening to Non-Monogamy Help, the podcast. And welcome to episode 39 of the Non-Monogamy Help podcast. I'm Lola Phoenix. Please send your questions to nonmonogamyhelp at gmail.com and they'll either be read in the podcast or the column anonymously. You can read the columns and the podcast by going to nonmonogamyhelp.com. Subscribe to our newsletter by going to tinyletter.com forward slash nonmonogamyhelp. And follow us on Twitter at nonmonogamyhelp. You can also become a patron. Patrons who donate $5 or more a month will have their names read at the end of the podcast. And just a dollar a month is also a really great way to show that you support the podcasts and the columns. Go to patreon.com forward slash Lola Phoenix. So before we get to our letter this week, the discussion question this week that I'll read, and that's for you to discuss with your partners or friends or anyone you'd like. And I answer it a little bit in brief to give you some kind of context, try not to be too long about it, and then you're welcome to take it on. Yeah. So the discussion question this week is, if someone likes me a lot, I start to feel dot dot dot. <clears throat> so when someone likes me a lot, I start to feel nervous generally. That's just because, you know, I don't tend to like people very frequently when I like them they don't tend to like me back (laughs) and so usually when someone likes me a lot I start to feel nervous because I get worried that they expect me to feel the same way back and I usually don't and it just makes me feel terrible (laughs) so yeah that's that's my situation if they do I mean every single time I've liked someone a lot and they've liked me back I've been in a relationship with them so and that hasn't happened very often it happens you know maybe very very like I can count the number of times on one hand so yeah it doesn't happen to me very often so yeah that's my answer to the discussion question I won't elaborate any further you get the idea so I'll just say it again if you would like to carry the discussion question on and it'll be in the description of the episode it is if someone likes me a lot I start to feel dot 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 elaborate with your friends partners loved ones all kinds of people Right, let's get to this week's letter. I'm married to my husband of nine years, and we've been polyamorous for half of that time. Up until recently, I also had a very serious boyfriend. When I first met him, my boyfriend was solo polyam, but we loved each other very, very deeply, so I became the partner he prioritized most. However, because I already have a primary partner, there were certain needs I couldn't meet for my boyfriend. So a year into our relationship, he decided he wanted his own primary partner and started building a primary partnership with someone else, which I wanted for him and wholeheartedly supported, and their relationship grew very rapidly. However, what followed was several months of the the worst polyam drama I've ever experienced. My metamor could see how much my boyfriend loved me, and it made her very anxious. As long as our relationship didn't grow, she she was okay with things. But when my boyfriend wanted to introduce me to his family or travel with me, she'd feel threatened and get angry with him. She had a more hierarchical view of polyamory, and she felt certain things should only be reserved for primary partners. She would repeatedly ask him how he could have more than one escalator relationship. My boyfriend would stick up for us and wouldn't allow her to limit us. Instead, he tried to help her work through her fears and insecurities, but it all caused a ton of conflict between him and his primary partner. Throughout all of this, I did my best to be supportive of their relationship. I was patient while my boyfriend worked with his primary partner on her fears, and at times I compromised what I wanted to help my metamor feel comfortable. I didn't want to be the reason their relationship failed, but I also didn't want to completely sacrifice my own needs and desires. I didn't try to limit how my metamor's relationship with my boyfriend could grow, and I wanted my relationship with him to also be able to grow. Eventually, their fighting got so bad that my boyfriend broke up with her. He then turned around and told me that he needed our relationship to be smaller. He said that everybody he knew started with a primary partner first, and then added other partners. He said he was doing it in reverse. He didn't... He said he wouldn't be able to meet a potential primary partner if he continued being so deeply involved with me. He said our non-primary relationship had become too important and that he had struggled with how to prioritize between me and his former primary partner, so our relationship also ended. This whole situation has left me wondering if it is even possible to build a primary partnership over top of an existing serious secondary partnership. Is this type of configuration inherently doomed to fail? Is it possible to build a secure primary partnership with someone new if you're already in a loving, committed, non-primary relationship with someone else? 
And as a secondary partner in this situation, how much should I set aside my own needs so that they don't threaten my partner's growing primary relationship? So I think that the biggest piece of information in this situation is what your boyfriend said when he said he struggled with how to prioritize between you and his former primary partner. And that's the key, really. It isn't so much that it's impossible for someone to to have a secondary but very important relationship with someone and then build a quote-unquote primary relationship that is supposed to mean more or whatever they want to define it as. It's that your partner had difficulty doing that. And I think that it's sad because I think that had your boyfriend had a more supportive person that he was dating, it probably wouldn't have been so hard. I think that it's understandable for his metamor to be scared, especially if she's new to polyamory and doesn't really know. But, you know, they have to come to an agreement of what primary means. And I think that's that's the thing here. There, And I've spoken about this before. Hierarchies don't have to be inherently shitty. And I think that a lot of people rail against hierarchies because of situations like this where they're so prescriptive or people use them as a reason to control other people rather than them being kind of guidelines for how someone might go about things. But I wouldn't be threatened by my partner meeting a metamor's parents. Uh, you know, I guess, well, I don't have parents for my partner to meet. So <laughs> maybe I'm less threatened by that because I, I don't have the equivalent. But, you know, the whole point of, a re of the relationship escalator, I felt that the point of that article was to point out that we make assumptions about how relationships should quote unquote grow, not that these are the way that relationships grow and that's the only way that relationships grow. You know, I think that it's it's sad that your metamor was so focused on these little things and thought that they should only be for her. And I don't know what your boyfriend did to negotiate that with her. I think that it sounds like he didn't feel like he could negotiate that with her and he is assuming that there's a right way to do this and there isn't. It's really sad. Like, he doesn't have to break off a great relationship that he has in order to find another one. And he, is, I'm really, I'm really even caught off guard by his assumption that he needs a primary partner. If he's solo polyamorous, you know, solo polyamorous people, generally speaking, you know, don't feel the need to have a primary partner. If they have needs that, you know, if they have things that they want partners to do with them that their current partners can't do, they can just find another partner. It doesn't necessarily have to be a quote-unquote primary partner. I don't know how familiar your boyfriend is with uh, solo polyamory or, or just polyamory in general, but there's no configuration that you have to proceed in. And, you know, if if someone is threatened by the relationships that this person already has, that's that's a problem that needs to be dealt with by him. And I think that, you know, you... I think that if you're a quote-unquote secondary and someone makes that clear to you, I think that it's, you know, just like you made clear to him that you had a primary relationship, so there were, there were things that you wouldn't be able to do with him. And I think that's fine. But, and I think that as a, you know, you have to kind of accept that if, if you're going to accept being in a quote-unquote secondary role. However... That doesn't mean that, you know, just because someone is a quote-unquote secondary doesn't mean that their opinion doesn't matter or that they should ne necessarily have to shelve what they think is an important in a relationship just because, you know, their metamor, whoever has the primary quote-unquote role, has decided that such and such is more important. You know, how people define what is an important or how relationships grow is, is really up to them. And that's something that you have to... You, it seemed like you had a good idea with that with your boyfriend, but it seems like the metamor had a different idea of that. And it seems like rather than realizing that a lot of the clashes in this situation were because <clears throat> the metamor had very specific ideas that he didn't agree with, you know, he can have a primary relationship. It doesn't mean that you're not allowed to meet his parents or that you're not allowed to travel with him. That's that's not what a thing he has to agree to. So it sounds like rather than realizing that this is this particular individual's way of doing it, he's decided that that is the way that everyone does it and that he needs to break up with you in order to find the primary person. And that's just, I mean, it, it, 
it sounds like I, I don't know. You didn't say that. That's what he did specifically. You said your relationship ended. You don't. You didn't say who ended it or why. But I'm assuming that that was a big reason why your relationship ended. It is possible to build a primary partnership over an existing s serious secondary relationship. The the you know it's like sort of saying is it possible to have a boyfriend if you have a best friend? It's possible to have multiple strong serious relationships in your life. It doesn't even have to be romantic partnerships. You know, now they're only 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week. It's not always possible for you to spend the same time. You know, it might be that when he does find someone he considers a primary and they agree with what that means and maybe that he spends less time with you. But I don't think that means that your relationship is smaller. Like, I, I, I really don't like the idea that spending less time together or... You know, I mean, maybe if he does want to, if you're not bothered, like if if I had a if I had a partner who was like, oh, you're a secondary, so you can't meet my parents, I wouldn't care. I'd be thrilled actually to not have to. Uh, I don't meeting the parents is a scary thing for me, so I, I wouldn't mind that sacrifice. But you know, it's just something that you you have to talk out and agree on. What does it mean? Because you can easily say primary and secondary and all these kind of catch-all terms, but people have different ideas as to what primary means. You know, for, mon for monogamous people, a primary is someone that's the only person that they sleep with, you know, but they still have friendships, they still have other relationships in their life that mean a lot to them and, and may be very serious to them. And, you know, it's it's kind of bothersome if, if someone feels threatened by their partner having a serious relationship with someone else. Um, yeah, that's... It just sounds like they disagreed on what primary means, and uh, unfortunately he took that to mean that that was how all his experiences were. Maybe he had some other experiences with people like that, and he just, you know, felt like he had to disallow you from doing certain things. But I don't think that you should sacrifice, you know, even if you are quote-unquote secondary, that doesn't mean that you... You know, what is your idea of a relationship? What what do you need in a relationship? And regardless of whether you're secondary or not, um, that shouldn't have to mean that you are discarded or that your needs aren't important. So you just have to figure out what, what that is and what's important to you. And I think it's, it sounds like you do have a good idea <clears throat> about that because you communicated very clearly to your boyfriend that, you know, you have this primary partner and that means that there are certain needs that you can't meet. And I think that maybe you know, he didn't have a very good idea of that. Maybe he has a better idea of that now. And it's really unfortunate, but yeah, it, it is it is possible um, to build a secure uh, primary partnership with someone new, even if you're already in a committed, loving relationship with someone else. And I just think that you should never set your aside your own needs. You know, it, there, are, there are things that you, pre like, set aside. You can compromise on preferences. You can compromise on some things, but you need to figure out what what is what are the ba what is the bare minimum that you need, and what are things that you can compromise on. You know, maybe meeting the parents is something you can compromise on because you're like, eh. if you're like me and you're like, that's a stressful thing. <laughs> and to me, meeting you know because I don't have any parents for my partners to meet, it doesn't mean that not meeting my parents means I don't care about them. But it obviously has you know for some people that has a lot of meaning. So maybe for you it doesn't matter that much because you've already met. I'm assuming you've already met your husband's parents. Maybe you already have that in your life and you could, you know, you don't need it for the second part. So it's just just figure out things that you actually really need and and things that are just, you know, things that you can do without. And I think it is quite difficult for him. You know, I know I it is quite hard if he'd never had that kind of setup before to try and negotiate that. And I think ultimately, you know, he didn't know how to prioritize and that ended up causing him a lot of stress and so he doesn't reasonably want to face that dilemma again you know it that might even if it sounds kind of crappy that he's he's been really affected by this unfortunate situation you know i, I i'm sad that he had that experience because i do think if he had a better experience he would have been able to prioritize things a lot better but I think if he if he genuinely feels like it's going to be hard for him, you know, he might come back to you when he has a, a primary partnership and feels a little bit more solid in, in what it is that he wants and what it is that he can give you. But yeah, it is possible. And I don't think that you, you, unless you are going out of your way to stop your partner from meeting or talking to other people, and even if you were doing that, 
it is ultimately your partner that needs to come back to you and say, nah, you, you know, you asserting your own needs doesn't threaten your partner's growing primary relationship. You didn't threaten that relationship. You aren't responsible for that relationship. That's your, that, that's your partner's relationship that he is responsible for managing and dealing with on his own, like maybe with your help and encouragement, but ultimately it's his responsibility to manage. You didn't threaten that relationship. That was a situation that had a lot to do with clashing ideas of what primary means. So please don't feel like in the future that you somehow having needs and existing is a threat to somebody else because it shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be if he's able to manage that situation and maybe he's not able to manage it and that's why he unfortunately ended it with you. But yeah, to sum up, yes, this is completely possible. This is a really sad, unfortunate situation. Please don't blame yourself for it. It sounds like he just couldn't prioritize, just couldn't manage. And, you know, it's really unfortunate for him. It's really unfortunate for you, but it's not something that you caused by having needs. And in the future, try to figure out what it is you need from a secondary and what it is that you can do without and negotiate that, you know, from the beginning of your relationship and don't kick yourself too hard for any of this because it's really it's, it's not your fault so i hope this helps and good luck thank you for listening to episode 39 of non-monogamy help i'm so so sorry about the background noise of this episode um it was recorded in the beginning of when lockdown started so there are as i said i'm not recording in a studio so there are going to be background noises flatmates all sorts of sirens a lot of fun stuff a lot of little easter eggs for you in the middle of my podcast um if you want to be awesome you can donate to the patreon donating five dollars or more a month means that your name with your permission will be read at the end of the podcast this week's current patrons are laura boylan chris albury jones duke and james wartell if for whatever reason you can become a patron because life happens if you can take five minutes to log into itunes find the podcast rate and review it that would be really really helpful it helps me get the podcast out there to new people if you don't want to write a review and you just want to do a rate that's also appreciated so if you have five minutes to spare i'd really appreciate you doing that if you can that's all for this week there will be one more episode of this season in a fortnight and you'll get a new column next friday and then remember after that week there will be a break because there's always a break after 10 episodes of the podcast Um, And I will see what I can do about getting out. I wanted to do a recording of one of my intro articles, and I might release that on the break that we have on the podcast. So, yeah, have a look out for that. Not this week um, or next week, but the week after that. Awesome. Thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to Non-Monogamy Help. Our podcast music has been provided by Chris Albury Jones at albury-jones.com and the art was made by Dom Jung at d-o-m-d-u-o-n-g.com. Thank you for listening.